let's talk a little bit about today's topic. So systemizing sales success. Um, I think, you know, I started in sales nearly 35 years ago. And one thing I, that I learned is sales is a profession. And there's no uni degree for sales, but good salespeople get paid more than most senior execs in organizations. And the way you become a good salesperson is you take it on as a profession. Now, the simple way to do that is to recognize that you can learn sales, you can improve sales, you can make your sales numbers grow by being really good at systemizing what you do. So I just want to talk a little bit about who we've got on the call today. We've got Ben Lay, who I've known for a long time now. Um, ben is a sales trainer, and he's going to be talking about selling for non-salespeople. We've got Craig Edwards with us today. Craig is a tech guy. He's got a propeller on top of his hat that you can't see. Um, he's going to be talking about how to use automation because I think that's such a critical element of sales right now. And I'm going to be talking about the numbers. And the reason I'm talking about the numbers in sales is I believe the numbers tell us the truth of what's going on. They don't lie. So we need to be using them to track sales. Um, for those who haven't met me before, my name is David Guest. I run Outcomes Business Group. We've been going since 2001, which makes us 20, nearly 25 years old this year. Um, and all I've done in all that time is help people grow their businesses. And I'll tell you now, in a small business, sales is the highest priority and getting good at sales will be the thing that changes the way that your business goes. Um, I want to talk about business for a minute. In this little diagram, which hopefully you can see on the screen, it's a bit small if you don't have me as spotlighted. Um, there's, a little, there's a little circle in the middle, which is operations. And when I talk to people in business, my first question is, how's business going? And the usual answer is business is flat out. And I say, flat out, good, flat out, bad. And they go, oh, we're just so busy. And the reason they're so busy is because they are the center of the universe. So their business has a big circle operations, a smaller circle admin, which means they do their admin outside of business hours. And this tiny little circle called sales and marketing. And the reason the sales and marketing circle is so small is that most people don't proactively sell. What I mean by that is their sales is usually driven by word of mouth or referral. Who's, who's in the situation where most of their business comes from word of mouth or referrals? I guess you get a show of hands on the screen. Excellent. You're doing a good job. But what I'll tell you is there's one slight problem with word of mouth or referral sales. And the biggest, the, the problem with it is that it's usually not something we can turn the volume control up and down on. So if we need to increase our revenue, word of mouth or referrals is not something we can rely on because it comes when it comes. So the reason that circle is so small is because of this little white box, which you can just see in the middle. And so for most people, when we talk about sales and marketing, they are terrified of creating a sales system within their business. And the reason they're terrified is they're already working so hard that if I said, hey, let's double your revenue, they would start thinking, how am I going to double my revenue? I'd have to work twice as hard and I'm already doing 70 hours a week. Is anyone in that situation that if we doubled revenue, they'd be working themselves to the bones? Can I just get a show of hands for those guys? There's a few. Awesome. At least we know where to work. So the ideal business needs to look a bit more like this. Operations, admin, sales and marketing should be about the same proportion. It's this little box with you in it that we need to move. And what I'd like you to think about is that as long as you're the center of your business, and I picked up this quote from a guy by the name of Ryan Deese. He said, the more valuable you are to your business, the less valuable your business is. Now, if you want to, you can screenshot that or write it down or just read it twice or I'll read it twice for you. The more valuable you are to your business, the less valuable your business is. Now, what this is talking about is the idea of your business having an asset value. And as long as it revolves around you, the only real asset within the business is you. So if you try to sell it and get out, the value reduces dramatically. In today's presentation, we're going to be talking about three things. And they're all revolved around sales. So the first thing I want to talk about is the numbers. And the numbers in sales are what should we be measuring? The second thing we want to talk about today is how do we automate? And automation is a big thing these days, and you can use it to actually increase your capacity to sell. And then the last part of what we're going to be talking just about today is what is the system that I can implement that will consistently increase my sales, even if I'm not a salesperson. So when we go through today's presentations, you're going to get a lot. Um, what I'm going to suggest is you take lots of notes. I would also like you to use the chat box. If you hear anything that's a good idea or resonates with you, drop it in the chat. If you have any questions of the presenters, drop them into the chat. We'll attempt to answer those questions as we go. But if we fail to do so, we'll, we'll do a Q&A towards the end of today's call. 
Um, hopefully everyone's okay with that and we can strap in and get started. Everyone good with that? Thumbs up if you're with me. I want to start with the critical numbers in sales and sales success. And the reason I use numbers is numbers don't lie. Because we can tell everybody how busy we are. We can tell everyone how everything is going well. But until you show me numbers, I have real, really no clear visibility about what's going on within your business. Um, and, you know, the problems that we're trying to solve is the need for more leads. Who thinks they need more leads in their business right now? Can I get a show of hands for those guys who need more leads? Okay, about a third. Great. Um, the other problem that we're trying to deal with is unpredictable sales, unpredictable sales. So we don't know when the sales are coming in and when they're not coming in and we cross our fingers and hope we're going to have a great month. The third problem we're going to deal with today and we're going to be talking about is marketing being an expense. And being an expensive thing, we tend to not want to invest dollars in it if we don't have dollars. So for most people, if I ask the question, what is your marketing budget? The typical answer I hear is one of two things. What do you mean budget? Uh, I don't have a marketing budget. Or the second answer I usually hear is the least amount possible. The least amount possible. Is anyone in the campus trying to minimize their expense on marketing? You know those? No? Okay. That's good. Good news. But the overall problem is that most people see marketing as a waste of time. Marketing and sales. They go, you know, I don't have time for this. I just need new customers. I just need great leads. The opportunity is simple. What we're going to be talking about today is how do we get continuous lead flow? So we're getting leads every day of the week. How do we get consistent sales so that we can predict how many new clients we're going to get next month? How do we create an unlimited marketing budget? Who likes the idea of having an unlimited marketing budget? Can I have a show of hands for those guys? There's only four. Good number. Excellent. I'm going to show you how we can do that. And then the last thing is really just making sure that we've got predictable cash flow because predictable cash flow will increase the value of your business. It will take away stress and anxiety. And I'll tell you now that if you're under a million dollars in revenue, you in any business, it, sales should be your number one priority. Sales above all else. Sales above all else. So let's start with this whole definition of accounting and sales and marketing. Any accountants on the call today? Any accountants on this call? Uh, we've got one. Okay. Peter, you know the answer to this. Sales and marketing is seen as an expense, right? Uh, if we look at a P&L, it's in the expense column. And if business is tight and business is tough, the first thing an accountant will tell you to do is cut your expenses, right? Now, I get the idea of cutting expenses to maintain profitability, but if sales and marketing is seen as an expense and you're not doing well and you cut sales and marketing to maintain profitability, you're going down a very slippery slope. What I need you to do is I need you to rethink this. I want you to start looking at the entrepreneur's view of sales and marketing. And the entrepreneur's view of sales and marketing is simple. Sales and marketing needs to be seen as an investment. Now, what is the difference between expense and investment? Super simple. An investment provides a return. An investment provides a return. So when I ask people about their sales or their marketing budget, and people say the least amount possible, the only reason they usually say that is because they don't see it as investment, they see it as an expense. Now, if we knew, like as an example, if I said to you, for every dollar you give me, I'll give you $2 in return. For every dollar you give me, I'll give you $2 in return. How much money would you give me? Just into the chat box. How much money would you give me if I guaranteed you $2 in return for every dollar you gave me. How much? Lots. Thanks, Colleen. All of it. Better. As much as possible. Hips, everything. Okay. Now, you can stop there because I'm not giving you $2 for every dollar you give me right now, but I'm going to show you how to do it, right? I find $5 billion. Thank you. I want you to keep this thought in mind, right? Because the reason we're not spending enough money on sales and marketing is because we see it as an expense, not as investment. Because if you knew you were going to get $2 for every dollar you spent on marketing and sales, you'd be giving me $1 billion, according to Ben, right? Or is that bajillion? But there's lots. There's lots of big numbers here. So the fact that we get, as soon as marketing becomes investment, not expense, we're willing to throw more money at it, is the first part to the formula. Second thing I want to talk about is this idea of indicators. Like when we talk about numbers, there's two kinds of numbers that we use in business, leading indicators and lagging indicators. Now, what's an example of a lagging indicator? It's really simple. It's an indicator that shows us what happened. And most lagging indicators will show up in our world as a dollar amount. And what I mean by that is a lagging indicator will no normally show up as a thing like revenue, profitability, average order value, all of these numbers are what's considered lagging indicators because they tell us what money came into our business. 
Now, one of the issues we have with lagging indicators is a lagging indicator. Using that to drive sales is like using the rear view mirror in your car to navigate around a corner. It's doable that it's super hard, right? The truth of the matter is sales is an activity sport, not a dollar sport. And the dollars are the result of making the sale. So the dollars are the lagging indicator. There's two numbers that I want you to, to contemplate today. And these numbers, if you're doing anything with sales and marketing that requires you to spend money, you need to know these two numbers. So the first number we're going to talk about is what's known as acquisition cost. Acquisition cost. Now, what is acquisition cost? Acquisition cost is literally how much am I willing to or how much am I currently paying to acquire a client? Acquisition cost. How much am I paying to acquire a client? Now, this number is easy to calculate because all you have to do is look at how much did I spend on sales and marketing last month. I'm including your time. And how many new customers or new sales did I make in that period of time? And I divide one by the other. Is everyone following me on this? Very simple mathematics. How much did I spend on sales and marketing? And how many new clients did I get? So I'll give you an example. If I spent $10,000 on sales and marketing because I paid the wages for a sales guy last month and we only made two sales during that time and watch what happens when I do it two on the screen. Hopefully it works. No, it's not work there. There we go, my balloons. I don't know why it happens, but it happens. Um, if I spent $10,000 and I got two clients, I would know that my acquisition cost was $5,000 per client. Is everyone with me on the maths? Just thumbs up if you're with me. Simple mathematics. I want you to, does anyone know this number for their business right now? What's their acquisition cost? Does anyone know this number? Hands up in the air. Okay, super interesting. I don't see any hands. What it means is that most people don't do this math. Ryan knows it because I made him cheating, Ryan. But thank you. Um, here, here's my point, right? I just told you how to calculate acquisition costs, and I'll tell you it's the most vital number to marketing that you will ever get because it tells me whether your marketing is an expense or an investment. Acquisition cost is how much am I spending to acquire a client? And once I know what that number is, my job is to reduce it. But if I don't measure it, I can't reduce it. So every day, from today onwards, I want you to ask this question. How much did I spend last month on marketing and sales? And how many new deals did I get as a result of that expenditure? Divide one by the other, and that will give you an accurate number for how much you are spending to acquire a client. Now, that's historical numbers because it's looking at what you're currently doing. The next question is a super interesting one. How much am I willing to spend to buy a new client? How much am I willing to spend to buy a new client? Now, now to answer that question, you need to know this number, lifetime value or LTV, lifetime value. Now, what is lifetime value? In simple terms, it's how much is a client worth to me in their lifetime? And I'm talking about dollars on both of these because acquisition cost is dollars and lifetime value is dollars. And what you need to know is how much is a client worth to you? Now, you can have lifetime value, or I heard a different variation on this called lifetime GP. Lifetime GP, gross profit. How much gross profit is a client worth to, is a client worth to me? Because if I know what that number is, my job is to increase that number. Now, my suggestion is if you want to have an unlimited marketing budget, you calculate these two numbers. What is my lifetime value right now? And what is my acquisition cost right now? How do I reduce my acquisition cost? And how do I increase my lifetime value? If you can do those two things, you will turn your marketing into an investment. If you don't know how to do those two things, you need to get someone to show you. It is not difficult. It's just if you haven't done it or if you don't have a system for doing it, it's hard to drive the truck, right? Because remember, we're using numbers to drive sales here. So I want to fast track into the critical numbers because I've given you an idea of two numbers. Does everyone understand the idea of acquisition cost, lifetime value? Let's get a quick thumbs up from those people who get this idea. Two thumbs if you get it. Hey, look at that. Don't ask me what that stuff is and don't ask me how to turn it off because it's something Apple did to my computer without telling me. But um, when we talk about critical numbers, and I just want to go through this pretty quickly because it's super important, but we've got limited time today. We've talked about the idea of lead and lag indicators and we're talking about critical numbers. And I'll tell you the first critical number in business, in sales, is most people think it's revenue. But those people who have been in sales for long enough or in the bigger organizations realize it's not revenue, it's actually profit. 
costs. Profit is the bottom line in business. And we know that revenue multiplied by a thing called, let's get some color in here, multiplied by a thing called GP will give us profit. So revenue times GP equals profit. Everyone gets that. So where does revenue come from? Revenue comes from a thing called a customer. And customers come from a thing called marketing and sales. And so we have customers, we have revenue, we have profit. These are all numbers that actually follow an equal sign, which means they're a result. Where do customers come from? Customers come from generating leads. And when what we need to do is we need to convert those leads, which we're going to talk about today, and that produces customers. Once we have a customer, it doesn't stop there because we actually have to get our customer to come back more than once. So we have a thing called frequency, how often a customer spends with us. Right? And then we have a thing called average order value, AOV. And that gives us our revenue. So how many customers we have, how often they spend with us and how much they spend with us gives us our total revenue for a period of time. Now, this looks complex, this formula, but I learned this from a fellow by the name of Brad Sugars many years ago, and it is so powerful that it's still valid today, probably more so than ever. I want to put some numbers here so you understand how this mathematics works. So let's imagine that we had uh, 4,000 leads generated over a period of time because we had a really good marketing company and we had a 25% conversion rate. 25% of 4,000 gives us 1,000 new customers. Now, if that 1,000 new customers spent with us twice a year, so we'd say times two, and the average order value just for simplicity was $100. Then we'd know that our revenue is 1,000 times two times 100, which is $200,000. Not a big business, but not a small business either. Okay, let's say we had a GP of 25%. So our profit would be 50K. Does everyone follow how those numbers went in? Does it make sense for everyone so far? Very simple. Okay, so now I wanna talk about how these numbers are super powerful. And if we had, a, if we went for a 10% increase and we said, you know what, we're going to get a marketing company to improve our leads. So we're going to go from 4,000 to, let's say we go to 4,400. Straight away, we know 10% increase in leads will increase our profit by 10%. So we should go from 50 to 55K. Everyone tracks that. Makes sense. But here's where it gets super interesting. Let's say we increased our leads by 10%. And then we also increased our conversion by 10%. So instead of 25, it was 27.5%. So if we increased our conversion rate to 27.5% of 4,000, we end up with how many leads? We end up with a compounding effect, which is super interesting. So instead of 20% increase, we end up with a 21% increase. So we end up with 1,210 leads. Now that 10 is significant, and I'll explain why. Because we had two 10% increases, and we just went from a 10% increase in profit to a 21% increase in profit because the two numbers compounded. Is everyone getting the idea of this, right? It's an old strategy, but it's super important. Compound interest works in sales and marketing as well as it works in our investment portfolio. But most of us don't do this. So then we talk about getting people to spend more frequently because everyone knows the statistic. It's six times more expensive to get a new customer than it is to get an old customer to come back. Who's heard that one before? Can I just get a quick show of hands on that one? Yes. But we know that we know that in our head, but we don't do that in our marketing strategy. And this is why one of the most important things I will ask you to consider is don't just go generating new leads all the time. Start nurturing the leads you have, right? So getting frequency out of your clients means getting them to come back. And if we had a 10% increase there, so we went from 2 to 2.2, and we did the same with average order value. Now, how do we increase average order value? What's the easiest way to get people to spend more with us on a transaction basis? Simple, upsell or cross-sell, right? Would you like fries with that, right? We've all heard that, right? But that hasn't been used for over 20 years because now they got smarter. They said, we don't say, would you like fries? We just offer a meal deal. So you get fries and a drink and then they upsize you. So they do three upsells. My point is that most people I meet in business do not have an upsell strategy because they're too busy looking for new leads. So let's imagine we only want to increase average order value by 10%, so we go from 100 to $110. So now we've got one, two, three, four 10% increases. Now, linearly, we would think that's a 40% a increase, right? But the truth of the matter is when we look at this result, we end up with 292,000, and I can't give you the exact number, of revenue, not just 280,000, 
we end up with an extra $12,000 because of compounding. Now we keep going with the compounding effect and we look at GP. What's the easiest way to increase our profitability? Does anyone know into the chat box? Easiest way to increase profitability? There's only two ways. You either reduce your costs, which is limited, or you increase pricing. I love the increasing pricing strategy. Two people have said it, two people have got it. The reason I love increasing pricing is it doesn't require you to work any harder. It just requires you to be better at sales. So let's imagine we increased our GP by 10%, so we went to 27.5. Our total profit right now in this business goes from 50,000 to 80,000, roughly. 50,000 to 80,000, that's an extra 30K. Now, it doesn't sound like much, but if you put your numbers in here and I said to you, we can increase your revenue by, by 46% and increase your profitability by 61% over the next 12 months, who'd be interested in doing that? Can I just get a quick show of hands? No one. No, just kidding. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so here's what I want you to think about. I just showed you that by increasing five numbers by 10%, we can compound the growth within our business. And I talked about these being the critical numbers. And I'm going to suggest to you that if you run a business and you don't know these numbers, you cannot improve things that you don't measure. I just want to do a fun thing for a moment because before I go on to that, I just want to talk about this. We have this plaque on the wall in our office. And most people say, David, this is not new. I've seen this a hundred times or I've seen some version of it. Who's seen this strategy before the multiple increases? Let's go and just get a show of hands with those people, a couple of people. It's not new, right? But here's the irony. Even though it's not new, people are not using it the way they should be using it. They're not using it to, to strategize growth in their business. So Bruce Lee said it best. He said, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough. You actually have to do something with the stuff we show you. So I want to just go back to this because there's an interesting activity I'd like to do. I'd like to give you the for fun thing. I want you to think about this. Could we double the number of leads that go into your business over the next 12 months? Would that be possible? Who thinks yes? Thumbs up. Who thinks no? Thumbs down. Double the number of leads. <laughs> we've got a lot of people saying yes. We've got a lot of people saying no. And we've got a lot of people not going to say a word. That's fine. If we went from 4,000 leads to different color, 8,000 leads. And then we said, let's get Ben on board and let's help him. Let's get some sales training and let's improve our sales conversion rate from 25%. We're going to double that. And I'm not suggesting you can do that, but it's possible. So 25% would go to 50%. 50% 50 of 8,000 equals 4,000. 4,000 customers instead of 1,000 customers. Here's where it gets super interesting. Let's keep compounding. Instead of getting people to spend with us twice a year, we get them to spend four times a year. So 4,000 times four. Instead of the average order value being 100, it's 200 dollars. Can anyone hazard a guess as to what the revenue of this business is going to be? I'll terrify you. 32 million dollars. 32 million dollars. So by doubling four numbers, we took a business that was had a 200,000 revenue and we've turned it into 32 million. And I'm not suggesting we can double all those four numbers in your business, but there are some that we could. And this is my point. Unless you know where to focus your attention, you're not going to see this level of growth. And just for fun, if we doubled our profit from 25 to 50%, anyone can, who can do quick maths knows that that's $16 million in profit. Now, imagine I said to you, you know what? I want to do this with you, but we might take more than one year. It might take five years. Who'd be interested in taking their business over a five-year period from 50,000 to 1.6 million in profit? Just curious. 1.6, 16, 16 million. It's a lot. Either way, it's a big number. Because when I show you these critical numbers, and I'm going to finish this up because I just wanted to demonstrate to you that using mathematics, we can actually work out where to grow our business. But here's where I want to finish this presentation. At the start, I asked who'd like more leads in their business. Can I get a show of hands for those guys who said they need more leads in their business? I'm going to demonstrate why this is not your highest priority. Right? We have five things that we can use to grow the business here, five things. And we always go for this one as a high priority num number of leads. But we also know that if we look at ease of implementation, the easiest thing to implement here is improving gross profit by increasing price. So I always say to people before, before we go out looking for leads, let's look at your GP situation. Can we increase your profitability? Because if we can, 
that's going to be the quickest way to improve profit. Number two is to improve conversion. Now, why do I put conversion as number two? Because you're already talking to people. And if you can get one in four to buy instead of one in six, you're doing the same number of sales calls, but you're getting better return on your investment. Has everyone got this? So it's leveraged activity. The one that I put at number three is average order value because that's really upsell, cross-sell, and you should be doing that at the time of sale, not after the sale. And the one, as I put it, number four is frequency, getting people to come back a second time. And guess where that leaves leads? That leaves leads as the lowest priority in this matrix, the lowest priority. Now, I'm not saying you don't need to generate leads because if you don't have leads, you don't have a business. But what I'm suggesting is there's four other places where you can concentrate your efforts, where you'll get better return on your investment of time and money first before you go spending all your money on leads. Now, if you take one thing from my presentation today, it's that there are some critical numbers in your business that most people admitted they don't know. They're there. They exist in your system. You just have to extract them and use them to make better decisions. Now, to me, this is fundamental to running a business. You must know your numbers. Okay. Um, I'm going to wrap this presentation up because we can go into a deep dive on this. I'm not going to. I'm just showing you how you can grow a business. What I do want to offer to you guys is pretty simple because I want to finish up on one thing. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing, expecting a different result. Now, you've all sat here today for only about 30 minutes so far, and you've learned a bit about how you can improve your business. If you don't act on what you learn today, nothing changes. Nothing changes. Um, I'm going to finish up on one thing, and, and I'm going to offer this to you. We've been experimenting because I've been doing this for nearly 25 years. And everything that I've learned, I'm now, I've put on an online training course, and I've offered it up online right now for free. I want to test this online training course. So I'm offering it to you guys. If you just scan on that QR code, or I'll get a hybrid to just pop the link into the chat box. This is on our website. There's no cost. There's no obligation. There's no catch. When you go there, there's four videos of me explaining how we use this particular model, which is getting back in control, building cash flow, growing your business, and leveraging yourself out. And it's all there for you to look at at your leisure. I want you to go in, and I want you to learn from there. If you need help with any of this stuff, please reach out to our team. If you just want to watch the videos, go for it. There's some downloads in there, some things you can use as tools. But what I want you to do is learn how to build a profitable business. So if you can get on there, that would be awesome. Excuse me. <clears throat> because in there, there's some great tools for you to learn how to grow your business and how to get your numbers right. In particular, when we talk about numbers, it's in that tracking area. But also, we'll, we'll take you through all the different elements, and I'm not going to go through those today. Um, what I'd like you to do is take advantage of this. It's going to be up for a limited time. If you can get access to it, just grab that link so you can use that after this presentation. I just want to talk about why this next presenter is so important. Um, one of the things that occurs, and this came up in our room, is time management, right? Having enough time to manage all these leads, having the capacity to manage them, and also knowing where everything's going on. Um, what I'd like to, well, who I'd like to introduce next is, is Craig Edwards. Craig Edwards um, is going to be talking about, and he's got his hat on so we can see he's from B. He's going to be talking about using the power of automation to increase efficiency, opportunity, and enhance the customer journey. So if you'd like to give Craig a nice warm welcome, let's see if we can get him up on the screen and make sure that his screen shares as well. Yeah. Over to you, Craig. Okay. Good morning, everyone. What a turnout we've had. Um, fantastic. And thanks, Dave, for your presentation. Lots of in, uh, insightful tips there we all, we're all talking about in the breakout room. Um, yeah, I've just I've got my presentation up. I hope, hope everyone can see that. Um, I'm just going to dive straight in. So quickly, just a bit about me. I mean, I've been doing this a long time in terms of uh, creating, designing, being in the brand and marketing space and now in the world of AI and automation. Been doing it for over uh, 27 years. I've founded and directed two agencies in that time in the last 20 years. Uh, I've seen it all and I've done it all in terms of starting out in the early computer, pre-computer days to design to the, when websites came about to when social media came about to when digital marketing came on board. CRMs, and, and obviously we're now in the era of AI. But what we're trying to do is, is now really just bring about more better intelligence, better technologies with the power of AI and automation to really optimise and your, your sales and marketing processes and systems to just drive that efficiency, as, as Dave pointed out. 
So first and foremost, you know, I guess for any business and, and for the customer, well, why automation? How does it help me? How does it serve me? Well, first of all, for the business, as Dave said, it creates efficiency. Uh, I went to a seminar yesterday and they talked about how in their business they do uh, they do quite complex market email marketing campaigns for their clients and they were just saving up to about 40 hours a week just in their email marketing using automation. Uh, great time saver efficiencies across the board. The next thing, it talks about creating opportunity. So uh, it allows us to take on more, but also we can use op automation to cr uh, create opportunity through our existing databases, as, as Dave pointed out, but also for new prospects as well. What does that look like? What is that, what's the touch points? How do we bring them into our brand? How do we bring them into our world? We can automate a lot of that without having to manually go, uh, go out and uh, what we call fish for people or, or uh, prospect our own pool. All of that can be done in, in the background. It's great for acquisition and it's great for retention. So talking about touch points and just... Um, what does that mean from a buyer's journey, all that sort of thing, which I'll, I'll, I'll dive into a bit later, but using automation to have a sequence of events from very first touch point to engage stage to you know decision stage, and, and which I'll, again, I'll explain it a bit more later. But again, once they're on that, uh, you bring them into your brand world, well, we want to re retain them. And, and what does that look like? We don't want them to, uh, I guess, uh, be, come into your business and then feel unloved. We want to be able to, send out multiple reminders and, and other, other means to either uh, cross-sell, upsell, uh, make them feel wanted, make them feel loved, because what that's also going to do is refer you, your business on to their colleagues and networks. So there's, there's a whole variety of ways that, that uh, how automation can help in that space. Also for the business we talk about, well, what it does with automation is that it, it creates a replicatable system. It means that if you're trying to acquire customers in a particular industry or vertical, you can take that same system and then and move it across into another vertical quite seamlessly. So what that does is it, it becomes a, a system for the business. And that ultimately, at the end of the day, when you come time to sell the business, it, it, it's a system sell and it adds value to the, to the bottom line when you actually come to a time of selling the business itself. For the customer... Well, in, in today's day and age, we're, we're moving away from that sort of generalist marketing approach of, hey, would you like this sort of thing? Whereas now it can be totally personalized. And I'm not just talking about the, the dear Craig or the dear David in your emails. It's, it's, it's offering uh, a product or a service that act, they're actually engaged in or interested in. So they'll be served a product service that they're looking for. Um, not just being a generalist. So um, it, 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 it provides that right. a better way to serve and engage based on their need. And, and through this in through this time, it also creates, it makes sure that you're, whether that they're at acquisition or even retention, it's just another means of keeping your brand top of mind through that entire journey, whether they're going through the sales funnels or whether they're an existing customer. Again, you're just keeping your brand top of mind. And what does that do? Well, it makes them think of your brand first outside of your competition. And that's what any business wants. And then at the end of the day, it, what it does, for, again, for both acquisition and retention, is it just creates a great uh, customer experience because they're going to they're going to want more. They're going to want either work with you from a sales perspective because you're, you're creating that, that great journey through those, those multiple steps. But also once they are a customer, you're serving them other things that are, that are relevant to them and, and the things that they need at that point in time. And that's just a great experience. And again, they'll just keep coming back for more. And, and beauty with automation, this is all happening 24 seven. So you're not having to do your general outreach is nine to five or you're just your general marketing nine to five. It can happen in the background. Um, so if you, and this is great for when you've got small teams, if you've got smaller uh, either sales teams or marketing teams, it, I guess it gives you an extra set of hands to all just work in the background seamlessly. So one salesperson can technically be 10. So that's the beauty of automation. One of the main problems that it does solve is that it stops leaking leads. So what I mean by that, and I see this quite a lot, is that where a customer makes an inquiry on a website, and nothing happens. They don't get a phone call or they don't get a response or they don't get a follow-up message to say, hey, thanks, Craig, for your inquiry. This is where automation steps in. And I've got an example of that when I'm going to talk about some three tips. 
So it al allows us to just to stop that leaky bucket. So wherever they come in, whether it's via the website or via email or even via chatbots or even via social media, people are now uh, communicating directly with their customers via social media nowadays. So we want to make sure we're plugging all those holes um, and that way automation can be there to, to take on that inquiry, uh, thank them for it, but also then lead them on the on that journey of hey would you like to speak to someone so we will, and then again the human doesn't really have to be involved that's where automation takes over and i guess and a big question for everyone today if you like to put in the chat if you if you like to is is, is if you have that leaky bucket you know how much opportunity are you losing each day you know if you're not responsive if you haven't got a system in place to respond to those calls or or, or emails or website inquiries every day how much opportunity are you losing? You know, I'll keep moving. So I guess nowadays, especially post COVID, there is a new way of doing things. You know, we have seen uh, sales teams and marketing uh, being uh, shrunk over that time. And, and also in that time, technology has evolved quite quickly. So what we've seen is people are more, I guess, coming out of the the, I guess the post-COVID era, and especially uh, this is more targeted to the, I guess the Victorian uh, people in the group who uh, you know, suffered two years of, of lockdowns. We've seen that people are more accustomed to buying via chatbots and online and QR codes. I don't, I don't know about you guys, but my wife went crazy with, on Amazon buying stuff during the COVID period because there's nothing else to do. So, and people who were not necessarily accustomed to, especially the older generation who weren't necessarily accustomed to um, social media, basically did get on board because they got onto Zoom and they got onto Instagram and they got onto Facebook during that time. So we've seen that that change of culture in, in terms of, the, of usage of pe people coming more familiar with QR codes, more familiar with chatbots. So you can see here, the, like like we did with the contact tracing, you take a you take a photo of a QR code. It ultimately leads you to a product or a web web page or an online product, and, and bang, you, you can buy that product. We've also seen now, I guess, um, in in terms of behaviours, is customers are wanting to a more of an instantaneous response. Whether that's they're looking to buy something or they just want more information on a product. You know, they don't want to spend hours and hours um, trying to find out uh, or uh, for, uh, research um, material or information on, on a key product or service, they just, you know, what can I find really quickly and understand whether this is a good fit for me. So we're seeing that trend quite a lot at, in, in, the, in the last two years. We're also seeing from a technology perspective with CRMs. Obviously, I'm not sure, I'm sure people in this group, you know, hands up if you do use a, a CRM. I'm also curious, hands up if people don't use a CRM. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm seeing lots of uh, businesses still that still aren't on CRMs and still using spreadsheets. But the point is, is that we CM, CRMs have evolved as well. They did really just start out in the early days uh, with just collecting names and numbers and details. But now they've, they've built up to a machine where you can basically run almost your whole business outside of the uh, accounting side. But in terms of all your sales and marketing, in, in, and Dave prefaced how important that was for, for a company, a lot of that can be all now built into CRMs in, in this day and age. And now with AI coming on and board, um, we're seeing that built in as well. So there's the, the CRM, if you haven't got one, I implore you to get one. Um, there's even free ones out there. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, a, it's a must have for any sort of business. So you can run your email marketing campaigns. You, you can do all your sales leads and, and follow ups and all that sort of stuff. But we, what we are finding with CRMs, though, it's it's not just about capturing names and numbers and emails. It's really understanding the buyer's journey. You know, where are they at? You know, are they at really this, as you can see on this visual here, are they at the awareness stage? Are they at the consideration stage? Or are they at the decision stage? So, and we can use automation and AI to br bring about that intelligence. So that way, it's not just capturing the name and the email. It's really understanding, is this buyer ready to buy now or is he a later person or is he still thinking about things that we need to provide some more information to nurture them to ultimately lead them to a sales conversation or a demonstration, et cetera. Okay, the biggest change, obviously, and I'm sure people have heard the, the, the buzzword is AI and it's, it's here it's, and it's here to serve. It does have the power to save time and cost. Um, 
I can show you on at another point in time on how that can how that can work. Um, I guess one of the things I do want to point out, though, and might be a, a point of discussion for people in the group here, is because I have heard around the traps a bit that people are a little bit scared of the term. You know, does it mean that I need to? Do I let people go? Does it replace jobs? Does it need to? to do I need to hire more people? No, it doesn't. It's not. It's not a be all end all. But it it is here to pick up slack. It is here to uh, do certain tasks and re um, reduce uh, manual tasks, uh, reduce repetitive tasks. That that, um, as I said, pointed out before, that one business who saved forty hours on on email marketing per week. That's how what that's how we can utilize it. But and it just helps drive that efficiency and productivity. So the power of automation plus the power of AI was just going to help drive that automation and productivity within the business without needing to hire more people, which is obviously a cost saving, but also not having, having to let people go either. We're just going to make them work, work smarter, work better, work faster. But also with AI is that it's the new knowledge bank or concierge, as we call it, for, for any business. So what we are finding is with, with AI is that it can learn so much about your business, all the ins, uh, the products and services, the deliverables, and from a, a customer engagement point of view. So I guess going back five years, people would go to your website and, and really just read through your website uh, about what you do, what you provide and how, what you offer. But nowadays with AI, you can actually chat with them directly in a very human, human tone and with plenty of personality and they can give you that instantaneous response by just asking asking a few key key questions. And I've, and I've got something to show you about that a bit later. But also that um, AI, um, from a sales point of view, has the power to source leads, qualify leads, set meetings, all on autopilot. So that's just one aspect of where AI can, can jump in. Now, I'm just going to talk about how Three really low cost ways, uh, how we can increase efficiency, opportunity, and a great, really great customer experience. And these are just easy takeaways that we can implement today. First and foremost, and I, and I talked, I touched on this earlier, is where in the old days, or even still currently, I suppose, is where if people want to inquire about your product service, they just they go to a contact form and they fill out some details and it goes into a website. Now, I I, I don't know how many times I've seen this, but I've I've asked. Uh, clients, you know, what did you do with those leads? Where, where, and they and they go, oh, I don't know. I think they're stuck in the ether somewhere or website if they're, if they're not a non-techie sort of uh, company. And sometimes they just sit there, they lay dormant, and that's just opportunity. Like we talk about the leaky bucket, that's just opportunity <laughs> we're missing out on. So where automation can step in is first and foremost, okay, well, as soon as I fill out that form, bang, I get a one, thank you, thank you, Craig, for your inquiries, uh, so we'll be in touch with you shortly. We can then send a secondary email that says, well, would you like a book, book a time with our sales team? We can even put a third step in there to, to ask, kind of go back to that prospect and just ask some key questions in terms of, you know, budget, industry, are they ready to buy now or later? What sort of products and services are, are they looking for? Just to get some qualifying aspects of this inquiry. Again, all on autopilot. And in the green there is where the human comes in. And you can see through that whole entire process, the, the salesperson hasn't really had to do lift, really lift a finger until they, they set that meeting with that person and on the far right. But they've already, they've already been pre-qualified. They've got some key information about what this, they're, they're interested in, what their needs are. And so that way the, the, the meeting, the sales meeting isn't a cold meeting. They've got a good understanding already. Plus it's already going into their CRM. Plus it's already telling whether they're a cold leave, warm leave or hot. And also talk, we talk about a lead score in terms of that grading system. So that's that's determining whether they're a, buy, a good buyer now or, or a buyer later. And then if they're a buyer later, we can then also set, automate that in terms of reminders and, and reaching back out to them two or three months or so or later. Another way to, uh, I guess, cap, to, to do with inquiries and, and sales and, and follow-ups and stopping that, you know, that leaky bucket is really having some sort of automated system through sales follow-ups, because we know, especially in the, if you're a sales manager or have got a sales team, you know, following up prospecting and reminding yourself to, to follow up with key people, especially if you've got long buying cycles, a lot of that just takes time. So you, we can automate that by, you know, 
on the far left there in, your, in the pink, whether they've come in via an email or chatbot or an SMS or WhatsApp nowadays or even social media, we can send those triggers out so they get the first response. Thank you for your inquiry. And especially if you scan a QR code, these are great. QR codes are great at events, great way of capturing details and great to send them a whole sequence of touch points that leads to a sequence. So think about this as if the inquiry comes in, they get the, the, the first, the second, the third touch points. We're using qualifying mechanisms by AI or other means to really understand who they are and where they've come from and what they're looking for. Setting a meeting, all feeding into your CRM. And on the far right there, we've got the human coming in to really take over, build the rapport, build the relationship, build, build trust, and ultimately convert that sale. But you can see that the guts of that is really just all automated. Um, and it's, again, it's all seamlessly done on all autopilot. So again, if you're just a one-man band, a salesperson, you know, you can basically look, look like a 10-man team doing this sort of stuff because it's working for you. 24-7. Now, I just want to give you, again, coming back to AI, um, people are curious, people are wanting to know what can I do for my business, and I thought I'd just give you a really short demo. Um, hope we're going okay for time, Dave, um, but I'll make this, yeah, I've got three minutes, okay, I'll make this really short, but um, yeah, I'll just give you a quick demo. So I'm just going to share my other screen here. So... AI chatbots is the new way of another layer that can integrate with your business. Again, if you're a smaller team or a smaller operation, but even bigger teams as well. Um, gone are the days uh, where a human is required to answer questions. But I thought I'd just give you a quick demo here where we can implement a, a chatbot here, which we can offer your sort of key offerings or services. This is just a, a demo of our, our model here but I will get a very much a personalized experience in an instantaneous form. So as soon as I say hi, it, it just it welcomes the person. It, it provides some bit of a spiel about um, what we're about. It wants me to, first of all, we've, we've programmed this to ultimately ask them to, to uh, capture the contacts details, which is important because we, again, we want to learn who they are, where they've come from. And also whatever I enter goes into the CRM. So, okay, it's already asking me, how can I assist you today? Well, I'm after um, some sales automation. And depending on the type of questions I ask or the way that I've programmed this, all of these are can be qualifying mechanisms. So it gives me a bit of an uh, overview of what how we can um, help them in the sales automation space. But now it's really taking trying to take me a that step further. Okay, well, what in sales automation uh, can you help me with? And I might just say uh, lead gen or lead generation. And again, we're using um, bots to program, to learn about your business, putting in uh, PDFs and documentation and and uh, really understand your business, but also uh, that then allows the bot to respond in a real personalized manner. As you can see here, it's really, really wanting me to dive even deeper in terms of what my goals are in terms of, what I want out of out of my uh, inquiry. So, but in uh, to cut uh, things short, I'm just going to say that I want to uh, book a meeting. I can dive deeper, but just in purpose of today, I'm just going to say, well, I want to, I want to speak to someone. Okay, so then the bot's responding that he wants to uh, dive deeper. Now we can uh, plug these chat bots into your t sales team or uh, calendars, and it will ask my time zone. And I'll say Australia. Now, because it's all synced up, it's given me my available times already. So I'm just going to say, well, yep, uh, Friday, 8 a.m. Is, is perfect for me. I respond in that time. And bang, that appointment has been scheduled automatically. So I will get an email uh, thanking me for that appointment. Your sales team will get an email. You'll get a, 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 a block out in your calendar that that sales team has been, book, has been booked. And again, all on auto, autopilot. And that can be plugged in 24-7. It doesn't have to be a website. It, it can also work through your WhatsApp. It can be uh, through social media. It's just another way of engaging. Um, so I'm just going to share my presentation again. Another way of engaging uh, inquiries and interest and in making that sales process uh, far more efficient, far more quicker. 
just to finish up my presentation, um, so if you're looking for help with CRMs and, and that automation side of things or integrating AI into your business and ultimately streamlining your whole marketing to sales systems, happy to help. You can scan the QR code there or I will put a link in the chat if anyone can book, happy to book a, a free chat with me and happy to explain in a bit more detail of how we can build, you know, basically build efficiency and create more opportunity and create better customer experiences for, for your business. Thanks awesome. very much. <clears throat> Craig, well done. Finished on time as well. But I think what you conveyed is a message of if people haven't got AI, they haven't got chatbots, if they haven't got automation in their sales process, they're leaving money on the table. And I think in simple terms, if you haven't spoken to someone like Craig about automation, and especially with AI being so new, how it can be used, because I don't think AI is going to take people's jobs. I think it's just going to get more stuff done in a shorter period of time. 100%. And that's how it should be seen. It's an accelerator. And so if you want to understand how to do that, book a call with Craig. He's into this. He spends his whole day fitting the propeller and looking at how all this stuff can make your sales and marketing look awesome. It's worth picking his brains. So I'd like to introduce our next presenter. And um, for those who haven't met Ben Lay, Ben Lay is a sales trainer. He's been doing this for quite some time. But he introduced himself to me one day and he said, I'm the guy that trains sales people who are non-sales people. And it perked my attention because a lot of people don't like being seen as salespeople. And I think in this world, in this day and age, if you are in communication with another human being, you are in sales. And so I'd like to introduce Ben. His topic is going to be how to create a simple three-step sales system that converts. And he's going to be talking through that now. So over to you, Ben. Thanks very much, David. Wow, what a mouthful that title is. How to create a simple three-step sales system that converts. Try saying that three times fast. But here's the thing. The stuff that I'm going to teach you today, if you put it into action, will get you results. It's, it's going to be simple. Therefore, it's going to be easy to apply. And best of all, it is proven. And I've tried it time and again with my own processes and my clients' processes. It works. It converts. First, I'll share a little bit about me. This is my lovely family. They're one of the main reasons that, that I'm in business. The other main reason is for all the faces in this room. I love helping people, especially entrepreneurs, to earn what they're worth. Oftentimes, the problem that they have is that they're afraid to sell. They've had bad experiences with salespeople in the past. And so they feel this negativity around it. And to, to help you along in your journey, I want to share a little bit of my story. I, what I love about this photo is, is that it was taken at a, a recent networking event. And it perfectly captures my introverted nature. Now, a really weird quirk about me is that I love having my me time and being left alone. And I don't like being in the spotlight unless I'm presenting. Then I, then I absolutely adore the spotlight. I don't know how, how that works, but that's my personality type. So if you feel like you don't have the quote unquote gift of the gab, uh, or you're not a natural salesperson, that's perfectly fine. Neither am I and neither was I until I learned the necessary skills, mindsets, and systems to be successful in sales. If you can follow a system, then you can be successful as well. And I'm going to show you today the three core areas that to systemize your, your process so that any leads that are coming in are much more likely to become paying clients. Now, just as a point of reference, like if you're measuring your inbound leads and your if your conversion is below 30%, then there's probably a lot of room for improvement. My personal conversion rate is somewhere around 50 to 60%, but you don't necessarily have to get to that stage. Uh, I mean, I do selling in day in, day out. But even if you increase from 20 to 30%, imagine how much of a difference that would be for your overall revenue. So David was kind enough to take you through all of the different metrics. If we just look at the conversion piece alone, going from 20 to 30% is a 50% increase in your overall revenue. And that's not even looking at lead generation. That's not even looking at price, right? So small changes can make very, very significant improvements. 
So here are the three steps. There's the qualifying call. Number two, there's the consultation. And number three, there's the presentation. Now, is that simple or what? It's only three steps. All right, let's start with the qualifying call. As Peter, Peter Burgess, he kindly put into the chat a reference to a study about response times. If you are responding fast, you are far more likely to win the business than if you take 24 hours to respond. So from that perspective, the work that Craig is doing helps a lot with this whole process. And in fact, you can automate this whole step. Uh, if, you, if you get so get in contact with Craig, you want to automate this, this step. Uh, I've served some clients where they're generating uh, over 300 leads per month. And can you imagine that they've got one salesperson trying to call all 300 of these leads, how much work that she has to do. But the thing is, not all leads are equal. Some will be tire kickers. Some will be uh, price shopping or they're, they're looking for uh, to buy in the next six to 12 months. You don't necessarily want to spend your valuable time or even your salesperson's valuable time talking to all these people. So having automation in this process is extremely important. But if, if you don't have that in place, phone them. Phone them within one hour. The faster you are, the more likely it is that you're going to uh, win their business. It's plain and simple. Now, what is the goal of this phase? It's threefold. Firstly, we want to pre-qualify to make sure that we're playing in the same ballpark. If you are in the business of helping medium-sized organizations and you get someone who's a startup business uh, inquiring, you don't necessarily want to go through the entire sales process. Now, I, I spoke to another case study. I spoke to a uh, client recently uh, and his challenge was that he went through the entire sales process for one particular prospect. Now, his minimum deal size is $50,000. So it's a very, very sophisticated product. Uh, and then he discovered at the closing stage of, you know, after spending hours and hours with this prospect, he discovered at the last stage that their budget was only $20,000. And so they were completely in different ballparks. We need to make sure that we pre-qualify leads so that we're not wasting their time and not wasting our own time. The second thing is that we want to earn trust and rapport. Now, here's the thing about human nature. We only take a few seconds to decide whether we're going to trust someone or not. So what you say, how you introduce yourself, the way you carry yourself, the way you speak is all going to be trust signals that people are going to use to determine whether they want to work with you or not. So this is one of the things that we have to be mindful of in the qualification stage. And then finally, if appropriate, you book the next steps, which is the, the consultation phase. All right, so what are you going to ask during the qualification phase? Uh, here are two go-to questions. What I mean by that is that I want you to practically ask these two questions virtually every call that you take. So when someone gets into contact with you, what you need to do is ask them this. This is a simple question. You can implement this straight away. What prompted you to get in touch? What is so powerful about this question is that you are trying to find out their motivation. Now, it's very well known in human psychology and in sales that people make decisions emotionally and justify with logic. This question is trying to figure out what emotion caused or what, what caused them to have the emotion to get in touch. So this is a brilliant, magical question. Always ask this at the first instant. So what prompted you to get in touch? Oh, I've got a problem with sales. Oh, tell me more about that. The second question that you would ask is more of a diagnostic question. Tell me a little bit more about your business. Now, if you've got your automation in place, you can actually do some pre-call research. So if they put their email address into, into the booking form, then you can look up their business and do some research. And instead of asking, tell me more about your business, you can actually say, I've already researched your business. I understand you're in engineering and you provide XYZ services. It's going to come across so professionally. You're going to leave a really good impression with your potential client. Next is what I call the back questions. You can tell I love my superheroes. I'm a bit of a comic book nerd. These glasses aren't just for a site correction. 
the bad questions is budget, authority, and time frame. Again, these are all really important questions to ask upfront to make sure we're in the same ballpark and dealing with the same time period. Uh, I, just for the sake of time, I can't go into detail about this, but just remember the bad questions, budget, authority, time frame. Who else is involved in this decision? Do you have a budget? Not what is your budget? Don't ask that. that that's, a, that's a rude question to ask upfront. Do you have a budget? And then when are you looking to buy? So here are your action steps from, today, from this segment alone. If you implement these, these will already get you results, I promise you. Respond fast within one hour and within minutes if you can. Ask the go-to questions and then ask the bat questions. Okay, over to the consultation. Now this is, um, a lot of the introverted and uh, analytical people are really good at this stage. Uh, and the reason that I've got a picture here of a doctor is because I want you to sell like a doctor. If you go into a clinic, what's the first thing the doctor does? They ask you questions. They, they do some investigations. They try to figure out what's the root cause of your problem before they diagnose. To do otherwise, like if, if they just said, okay, here's your medicine after you've said, oh, I've got a headache, that would be considered medical malpractice. Yet, so many salespeople and so many entrepreneurs, as soon as they hear a problem, they say, I've got the solution for you without doing any further investigation. That is sales malpractice. Stop it. Stop it. No. <laughs> Ask the questions. Do your diagnostics. Figure out what's going on before you recommend your products or services. Now, here are the goals of the consultative phase. It's to discover what they care about and why they care about it. If you can't figure out the why, then you're going to lose them along the process. So how do you go about doing that? You ask grow questions. So some of you may be familiar with the grow framework. It actually comes from the coaching space. Now, here's the interesting thing about the grow framework. People will pay thousands of dollars to be asked these questions. So David being a business coach, I'm sure he asks grow, grow questions all the time. People pay David thousands and thousands of dollars to ask them these questions. The grow questions are goals, reality, options and obstacles, and where to from here. So imagine this, you're going into a sales process with someone and you are offering them a service that people normally pay thousands of dollars for, but you are not charging anything for it. Now, true story, I had a recent uh, prospect who, after I took him through my grow question framework, said to me that I've given him so much value just from our initial conversations that he's willing to leave a positive review for me on Google. And lo and behold, he also decided to sign up. <laughs> so so give you can give tons of value by asking these questions because it helps it helps you to gain clarity on what they want, but it also helps them to get clarity on what they want, what they want to achieve, what are their options. It is inherently valuable and you're not charging anything for it. So here are some examples of the grow questions in action. So again, with, it's a new lead. You ask them what prompted you to get in touch. Uh, and then you follow on by saying, what is the desired outcome that you're looking for? So in in my case, uh, I will often ask, uh, what's your revenue goal? What's your conversion goal? Uh, then you might ask, what's working? What have you tried before that that's not that that's working? Uh, but also, what's not working? Uh, and then once you find out the gaps, then you can be a lot more surgical in terms of figuring out what you should be proposing to them. And always make sure that you schedule next steps. Okay, this is a very, very important point. A lot of people do not do this. It's simple, but people are afraid. Schedule the next step. Put it in the calendar. Treat it as if it's a dentist appointment. Unless, of course, you don't turn up to your dentist appointment on time, in which case, treat it like a different kind of appointment. Okay, so that's the GROW framework. You've found out what it is that they care about, but you want to dig deeper. It's not enough just to get a superficial answer. If you can tap into what they really care about, you're going to move them emotionally. And here's the universal question that I want you to ask. What would it mean for you? So let's just say they, they've revealed they want to double their business in the next 12 months. And I would ask, what would it mean for you 
if you were to double your business. And they reveal that, well, it means we can hire more staff, we can buy more, we can invest in more equipment, we can invest in more training, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I might even follow up again. And what would that mean for you? Well, it would give me a great sense of achievement. It would help me to fulfill my life's dream. Now, that is a motivation worth clinging on to. Once you've asked these questions, then you need to practice what's known as active listening. Now, most people are familiar with these two parts of the uh, active listening uh, equation, which is paying full undivided attention, and then to paraphrase back to the person what you understood, or to contribute to the conversation. So you can't paraphrase all the time, otherwise you'll sound like, sound like a, an intelligent parrot. <laughs> you need to actually contribute to, to the conversation. But uh, I, I discovered a third step in active listening when I was driving my kids home from school one day. And uh, I, I was trying to teach them to converse with me. So I will always ask them, how was school? And they'll say, oh, yeah, it was good. And then they will whinge and whine about their problems at school. And then I'll say, OK, now you ask me about my day. And they will say, how was your day, daddy? Uh, and I would say, oh, it was really great. I, I delivered a seminar today. And they would say, what's for dinner? <laughs> they would immediately change the topic demonstrating that they did not care about my seminar or my day at all. So the third component of active listening is to ask the follow-up question. Always follow up to show that you're at that trail of interest so that you're demonstrating that you actually care about the answer to your question. All right, so this is the consultative phase. Here are the action steps for you. There's the grow questions, there's the universal question, and then there's active listening. Third step, presentation phase. Now, here is a very important framework for you to understand about human behavior. I call it the persuasion triad. It has nothing to do with the gangs in Hong Kong. It's actually from Greek uh, origins, right? So there's the ethos, which is your credibility, the pathos, which is emotions, and logos, which is logic. You need all three layers of this for a person to make a decision but there is a hierarchy of importance here. The credibility is how believable you are. It has to do with your level of and depth of knowledge um, and the way that you present yourself. Without credibility, people will just simply not believe you. I mean, if I rocked up in a singlet and my, my room is looks like a, like a trash dump, I would lose all credibility you would not care about how persuasive I am because I have not earned your trust. Similarly, emotions are next important because without emotion, there's no action, but without logic, people will have buyer's remorse. So all three are important, but there is a hierarchy of those three. Let's cover how you can increase all of these. Firstly, with credibility, here's a really important thing to remember. People will believe in you to the degree that you believe in yourself. This is a really scary fact because there are so many entrepreneurs out there who are really darn good at what they do, but they are afraid to present themselves as being an authority and credible at what they do, which is very sad because there are also many people out there with very low credibility. They don't know their stuff. They just, they're just good marketers or good salespeople. And so they are the ones winning all of the business because we are too afraid to present ourselves as being a credible, authoritative source. So my, my encouragement to you is that if you really believe in what you do, present yourself that way. Don't be afraid to be assertive and to show people your level of authority and your knowledge. You've got to present yourself and speak in such a way to inspire confidence in others. The second thing is the emotions. Now, this is a really cringy photo, but it really demonstrates the importance of speaking with emotion. Can you imagine if I presented today's topic is how to increase your sales systems and conversions? You would not pay attention. You would have a snore fest. And so in the same way, I see so many well-meaning entrepreneurs, they do not know how to express themselves. So my, my advice for you here is to practice being overly expressive. When I'm with my kids, I'm overly expressive. 
I read books to them. I read it in character as if I'm the characters. Have a go with that. With uh, whenever, whenever you have a chance to express, take it up, take it up to 11. And what happens with most of my clients when I ask them to do this is that they will actually just go up a few notches and they'll actually sound really good, really entertaining. Now, that's more of an advanced thing. We can go into more detail at another time. All right, for the logic side of things, here is how your presentation should be set out. Number one, recap the goals that they want to achieve. Number two, you show them your process on how you're going to help them to achieve their goal. And finally, uh, the proof that you can. So testimonials, case studies, and the like. Now, when you're explaining any attributes of your process or, or anything about your service or your product, here's what I want you to do. I want you to use the universal translator. So Spock is the embodiment of logic for those of you who know Star Trek. Uh, and, and if we want to speak the same language and reach people on a logical level and an emo emotional level, we need, to, uh, we need to make this statement, what this means for you is. What this means for you is. So, so I, I've been in business for 11 years. What this means for you is that you know that you're going to get really good training uh, from me and that you, you know that you're going to get the results. Okay, so we do need to speed along. Three things, credibility, emotions, and logic. And you, as a technique, use the universal translator. Okay, so let's quickly summarize. Three things that in your sales process, qualifying call, the consultation, and then the presentation. Now, if you want to work with me, here's how I help clients. Uh, David took us through the, the, uh, the equation. This is the simplified version of it. I can help you. I can help with leads somewhat, but uh, if you need larger scale, then you should be talking to marketing firms. Uh, but predominantly, I help with pricing strategy and conversions. And if you increase your prices, you're going to need the sales skills to back it up. So if you want to work with me, I'm offering complimentary sales strategy sessions. Now I'm booked out for almost two weeks, but if you want to, please apply by the 25th of April. So that's one week from now. Here is the uh, the code, the QR code, or you can type in salesethos.com.au slash EOI. Uh, I promise you, I'll, I'll, I'll go take you through this whole process. You can see it in action and you can apply, learn from me and apply it to your own sales processes you can you're, you're welcome to steal whatever ideas you like <laughs> apply it for yourself thank you so much for your time amazing ben everyone give ben a nice uh, round of applause he managed to squeeze too many things into such a short time we've got a few more minutes left so if there's any questions that anyone has now's your opportunity to pop them into the chat while we're, we're all here i have one question why haven't you booked the time with each of these three people yet <laughs> because we've given you gold on three levels. We've talked about the numbers, the logic. We've talked about the sales process. Ben's presentation style can be applied to anybody. Craig's shown you how you don't even have to do half the work, the system will do it for you. And you know, one thing I learned, and I learned this from a friend of mine who's a sales trainer, and he said, you know, some people forget how important sales is. And to me, sales above all else. When you're a small business and you're looking to grow, you need to look at sales as the most important thing. And sales requires all of these elements. It's not just a better sales technique. You need leads. You need lead management. You need numbers. You need to know who you should and shouldn't be talking to. Ben talked about triaging. I 100% agree with this. I know there's someone on this call that needed this conversation today, so I think your timing was perfect, Ben. Um, what I'd like to do is if I can get um, Ben's put his booking link in there, click on that and book a call with Ben. Just do it. Second, Let's Craig, get Craig's link back in there, if you could, please, Ira, so that people can book a call with Craig. I didn't put a booking link in there. I want you to go and do my training. My training is for business owners. It's going to teach you how to build a better business. And when you go through the training, there's options to book a time with, with me as well. Um, I'm hoping you got some great value. But what I'd like to see in the chat right now is what is the top three lessons that you got out of today's session? I do not want you to leave this presentation without having your lessons articulated because as you can see, we're here to make sure you do stuff. So what are the top three lessons? Pete Burgess said top priority, lead gen, sales, um, number two, and number three, products and pricing. Uh, Warren said top three, but he hasn't told me what they are, so they're coming. I wanna see, what did you get out of today's session? Into the chat box so we can share it with everyone else who's on this call. What are the most valuable things you got out of today? Automation with the initial inquiry, 100%. You know, speed is the currency of today. And people expect responses immediately. Make your business an asset, not you as the asset. Thank you, Emily. 
Um, what else have we got here? AI can make our lives easier. Absolutely. Discover what they care about and why. 100%. Thanks, Alvin. Um, speed in response, yes. Conversion, increase, listen, automate. Yeah, 100%. What prompted you to get in touch? That's a brilliant question. Really tying into the emotions about what uh, people um, are connecting with you for. Focus on the basics. The fundamentals are super important. Figure everything out before offering solutions. Yeah. Don't waste your time telling the people who aren't ready to buy. And I think another one Ben snuck in there very subtly is make sure you book the next action. Do not leave a sales call without a very clear next step. Right. Um, automate, automate, create a formal process to adopt the strategies. Not all topics were new, but brilliant reminders. They're definitely not new because sales has been around for quite some time. But what I do find is that if you do not refresh your view of sales, you will be left behind. It will neglect it. Even in our small breakout room, people said, this was a great reminder of what I should be doing. Um, automate your sales, know what to say, and be human. Universal questions, automation and CRM. I need to take automation seriously. Yes, you do. Um, review sales process automation. What would it mean if you? Yeah. Marketing equals selling more products at a higher price. Review my sales. There's so many good lessons here. Acquisition costs, lifetime value, speedy response, knowing your prospects and clients' research. Don't be scared to increase price. Um, be confident in yourself. Yep, lead generation, automation equals emotional connection. Key numbers was awesome. Uh, the bat question, be Batman or Wonder Woman. Yes. And then I refined that to say, be Dr. <laughs> Batman or Dr. Wonder Woman because you need to be like a doctor. Awesome. This has been an amazing presentation. I really hope that you guys got some great value. I am mindful that we only have two minutes left. And what I'd like to do is I'd like everyone on the call to please acknowledge our presenters of doing such an awesome job. So if you can show them some love, that would be amazing. Um, I hope you got some really valuable lessons out of today. We have got a recording that will go up for about a week um, for those people who want to review this. But I think really when we leave the scene of a presentation like this, you need to act immediately because having a list of things I should do later will go in with all your other lists of things I should do later. Act now, right? If you have something that you need to act on, if it's booking a call with one of us or one of these guys, if it's getting into the training, do something right away straight after this call just to make sure you've got that momentum. Because I know that we're, we're moving into a new phase of the economy. It's going to get tougher and not easier. And I think those people who are prepared for that by actually sharpening their saw and making sure that they know how they can improve their conversions are going to be the winners. So I'd like to thank the presenters. I'd also like to thank everyone who's joined us on this call today, uh, spending, investing, I should say not spending, investing your time with us. Hopefully you got more value out of today than it cost you in the hour and a half to, that you invested with us. And that's our goal every time we run these sessions. So thanks so much for hanging around till the end. I know that you got value out of it because I knew these guys were going to smash it through the park. Um, please enjoy the rest of your day. If you've got any questions of any one of the presenters or myself, please reach out to us. You've got our contact details. So maybe open up your mics and give these guys some love and thank them for their for, for their time today before we wrap up. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. It's thank great. you. Thank you. Great, great session, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.